open our Bibles to Colossians. Uh, hopefully, Lord willing, we will finish up chapter 1 this evening. And Colossians 1. Babe, were the, was there something I'm, I was supposed to let people know about? No? I thought we were talking about something earlier today. <laughs> okay, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All righty. It's, it's good to see uh, you know, some of you coming back, and especially those that were, were sick and, uh, and that have recuperated and, and uh, now are back. Yeah, and, uh, you know, eventually, you know, we're going to have the whole gang back, right? It's just everybody's going to get through it, and we're going to have, have the herd immunity. Nobody's going to have to worry about getting it for the rest of the year, <laughs> right? All right, Colossians 1, let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much, Lord, for, for you, your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your loving kindness. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, you have told us that you have given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Lord, help us this evening to receive from you. Lord, that we would uh, look at some of these things uh, that you have for us, even, even though they may seem maybe dry or technical or something like that, but that we would understand, Lord, how important it is to know truth, Lord, to know your truth that we would be really protected from error when it comes our way. Lord, we pray you'd bless this time now, in Jesus' name, amen. Remember, Paul is writing Colossians uh, as a prisoner in Rome. He's, he's in prison for the gospel's sake. Uh, he's addressing a problem that was going on uh, within Colossae. Uh, and actually, these, these heretics were uh, bothering other churches, too, with the same thing. Uh, kind of referred to as the seeds of Gnosticism. But uh, Gnosticism would kind of eventually evolve from these guys uh, probably by the, uh, about another 50, 60 years after uh, Paul had written this. And these guys, the Gnostics, they believed that you could achieve salvation and perfection before God by obtaining some secret knowledge, by getting this secret knowledge and understanding these things that was only available to a select few that you could attain to that level uh, of perfection and that. And, and so Paul uh, wrote against that, and we've already seen some of that. Also, one of the things that they held to, uh, we discussed this already, that all matter was evil. If it was material, then it was evil, which included our, you know, our bodies. And, and since Jesus wasn't evil, they said, since he wasn't evil, then Jesus couldn't have had a physical body. Uh, which was nonsense, uh, nonsense <laughs> altogether. And we addressed that too uh, in the first and second uh, studies within Colossians. But last time we left off, and it seems like it's probably close to a month ago when, <laughs> when we were actually here, uh, we left off with a conditional promise of God. And look at verses 21 and 22. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And that's just such an awesome promise. Remember, uh, Colossae was a Gentile city, and these, these believers in Jesus there, they were once alienated. They were enemies. By, by what they thought and by what they did, their works. But now, because of their faith in Christ, they had been reconciled. Jesus brought them into a relationship with God by the death of his flesh, it says. See, right there, he's addressing that whole concept that Jesus didn't have a physical body. You see, no, he, he did that uh, through the body of his flesh, through death to present you holy and blameless above reproach in God's sight. And we saw how the Colossian church really came into existence, how they came to faith. Uh, they, 
they heard about Jesus and put their faith in Christ uh, after they heard the gospel from that guy named Epaphras. And he was teaching, preaching the gospel there, and Paul had endorsed him earlier in the chapter, saying, yeah, we're, we're on the same page. We're, we're preaching the same message kind of thing. And it, it was that, that gospel of grace through faith. Paul uh, kind of put it in a nutshell in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, where he said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. And that's the message that Paul went about and preached over and over and over again. And, and anybody who was preaching that, Paul was like right on. Epaphras was bringing that same gospel. And that's how Paul could assure them of their righteous standing before God because they had received God's grace by putting their faith in Jesus and his death on the cross uh, that was payment for their sin and for our sin. And that's the only thing that could pay for it because Jesus didn't deserve to die. He was a, a man, but he was a perfect man, never sinned, so he didn't deserve to die, so he could die in our place, paying for our sin. And by by putting their faith in him, by us putting our faith in Jesus, our sins are, are completely removed and we're made righteous. We're standing in the righteousness of Christ before God and that's what he sees. Too often, we as believers kind of think that, okay, yeah, I got saved that way by grace through faith. But then as we go through life, sometimes we think that, well, things kind of change once I get saved. Now I've got to do this and do that. I've got to keep the law. I've got to keep this or that. And if I fail, if I mess up, then God sees me for all of my sin. And, you know, I've got to do this or that before I can approach God. But that's not it at all. When we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and we're still standing in the righteousness of Christ. We come, we confess our sin to him. He's faithful and just to cleanse us uh, from our sin and from all unrighteousness. And so, again, he looks at us just through the righteousness of Christ. That's where our standing is. That's what theologians call our positional righteousness. We got into that a few weeks ago. But there is a condition to this promise. Look at verse 23. If... Indeed, you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, by saying he preached it to every creature under heaven, uh, that's, he, you know, he's using a hyperbole and saying that basically that the gospel went through all the known world, um, and we know that, okay, it hadn't gotten to South America yet. It hadn't gotten to a lot of places. But in the known world, the world that he was writing to, you know, gosh, everybody uh, had heard about it. And remember, one of the complaints about the Christians that the Gentiles had, those that were idolatrous and they wanted to stay in their idolatry, remember when they said, these are the ones who turned the world upside down using that same kind of hyperbole that, man, the whole world's gone after this Jesus kind of thing. But remembering why this letter was written, that these heretics that, that are now known uh, by the title of Gnostics, they were trying to sway the believers at Colossae away from their faith in Jesus. And that's what he's saying here. If you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, Remember we talked about Sunday, about there's a time when we need to have kind of a, a, a resolve, a kind of a hard head when it comes to sticking to the truth, that we wouldn't be moved, we wouldn't be swayed away from what the truth is. And he's saying, don't be moved from that. You know, this promise, it's yours. And they were trying to, trying to sway the Colossians away from that simplicity that is in Christ. And they were trying to convince them, again, that they had to pursue some kind of you know, bizarre secret knowledge that was available to only a select few. But if you were fortunate enough, <laughs> you, know, you might be able to attain eternal life through that special knowledge. But he says, that's nonsense. It was through the death of his flesh that we have been made right with God, that we will be per presented perfect before God. And, and you just need to hang in there with that. Don't be swayed. 
You know, Paul's warning them and really warning us, every believer in Jesus, to stay the course. You know, to don't give up on Jesus. Don't pursue some other kind of nonsense. Don't let the heretics move you away from the true gospel, in their case, that they heard from Epaphras. Um, and, and again, Paul had endorsed him just a little bit earlier in the chapter. And, and, you know, this brings up the whole eternal security thing, the once saved, always saved deal, you know. Oh, wait a minute. You know, if indeed you continue in the faith, if, you know, they're, 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 they're in the faith right now. They believe in Jesus. If they're, if they're continuing in the faith, if they're not moved away, and you have to be someplace to be move, moved away from someplace, right? <laughs> if you're going to be moved away from the faith, you've got to be in the faith. Well, he, he's, he's telling us to stay the course, but people come up with, well, okay, what's that mean then? What, the argument of once saved, always saved, the eternal security uh, question and all that stuff. And, and really, I hate arguing about it. I mean, there's, there, there's so much in the Bible <laughs> And that people sometimes will use the same script, scriptures to, to make their case. But no matter what side of that, that question you're on, what side of that doctrine you're on, the deal is we all agree that only those who believe in Jesus are saved, right? You believe in Jesus, you're saved. If someone doesn't believe in Jesus, then they're not saved, right? Jesus said in John 3, 18, we always quote 16, we will in a minute, but in verse 18, he said, he who believes in him, that's in Jesus, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And when someone, quote, walks away from faith in Jesus, uh, you know, I don't, I don't even like the saying uh, someone can lose their salvation because it's not like, you know, you, you're saved and you're rejoicing and you're praying at night, you go to bed, you wake up in the morning and go, where'd my salvation go? I, I mean, it was right here last night. Where'd it go? Kind of thing. <clears throat> but, you know, I've known those people who have professed Christ and then later on in their lives, no, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. <laughs> and if they used to profess faith in Jesus but now they don't. They say, I don't believe in Jesus anymore or whatever. Uh, there are some that will say, well, that wasn't real salvation. It was just a said faith. They just profess to be believers. They look like a Christian. Uh, they kind of sort of acted like a Christian, uh, but they didn't really believe. They didn't have the kind of faith that saved or else they wouldn't have left. And that's possible. There are scriptures to support that. I mean, you Talk about uh, the 12 that followed Jesus. You know, there was Judas. And Jesus said, haven't I chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. Devils can never be saved, right? <laughs> and, and then there are others that would say, well, they might have been saved. That faith was real at one time, but they don't have faith now. They stopped believing. They're not going to heaven if they don't stay, you know, if they don't repent. If they stay in that state of unbelief until their death, well, they're lost kind of thing. You know, and there, there are plenty of scriptures to support that position as well. I'm glad that it's God who decides, you know. I don't have to decide that, you know. But the deal is both sides agree that, the person that doesn't believe in Jesus is lost. Right? I mean, if you're not a believer, I always say, you know, if a believer stops believing, is he still a believer? That's kind of a question you want to wrestle with, you know? Uh, and a person who is lost, a person who does not believe in Jesus, whether they once did, but it wasn't a real belief, or they, they did, and it was a real belief, but they stopped believing, or whatever, that person needs to believe in Jesus, Right? If they put their faith in Jesus, he won't reject them and all that. Now, there are some that, that will say, a few people, not very many, that will say, well, no, they're still saved, even if they don't believe in Jesus now. Because they prayed the prayer when they were younger, they're sealed, then they're okay. They're, it doesn't matter what they believe now. And, and you know, <laughs> I, I just that concept is just bizarre to me. 
It's, it's like when they die, you know, they die hating God. And, and when they die, God will force them to heaven. Kind of like a parent, you know, with a disobedient child. You get up to your room right now. <laughs> and God's going to force them to live in heaven for eternity. Usually that position is kind of the irrational hope of a parent whose child has gone astray kind of thing. But believers are saved. And, you know, people can argue about this, you know, till the cows come home. But only, the only person who can have real, complete assurance of their salvation, who can be totally confident that Jesus will present them to the Father, as Paul says here, holy, blameless, and above reproach, is one who continues in the faith, a person who believes in Jesus, God's only begotten Son. Again, John 3, 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You're not sure? Well, put your faith in Jesus. <laughs> and and you, you, you could be sure. And, and, but notice that Jesus said, who believes. That's present tense. It's not, well, whoever believed at one time or whoever used to believe, it's who believes. And, and if you know somebody that's not sure, you know, I... I I think I say I know pretty much everybody here personally, and I know you believe. <laughs> I know you're trusting in Jesus right now. But if you know somebody that doesn't, well, then, you know, you need to present stuff like John 3.16 to them or, or like what Paul and Silas told the, the uh, Philippian jailer in Acts 16.31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Yeah. <laughs> believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. Same goes for your household. You know, they put their faith in Jesus, they'll be saved. Trust him. <laughs> Trust him and what he's done for you on the cross, and there's no doubt about where you will end up. And so instead of chasing our tails all the time and arguing amongst ourselves about the eternal security question, just <laughs> believe in Jesus. And the people that don't believe in Jesus, whether they did or didn't, or did once and all that other stuff, just... <laughs> <laughs> remind them they need to believe in Jesus. Only believers are saved. And now, so Paul turns a little bit of a, a corner right now. He's going to talk a little bit about his sufferings and what that was all about. And, and remember when we were studying the book of Philippians that we saw how there were the heretics that were going around and saying that Paul wasn't a real apostle. And the reason why Paul was going through all the hardships, all the suffering, all the affliction that he was going through was because he was in sin. He was out of God's will. But because they weren't suffering the persecution and all that stuff, that was a proof that God was pleased with them. And as we saw there in Philippians, just the opposite was true. You know, these guys were heretics. They were enemies of the cross. But Paul, because he was preaching the gospel, was being persecuted uh, for the truth. The enemy was a set. You know, you ever realize that? The enemy doesn't get too bugged about any other religion. <laughs> you know, you could believe in any kind of weirdness out there that you want to believe in. Hey, cool, man. But you say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Ha! <laughs> I kill you. <laughs> and it's just, it's just one of those things that, that th there's one way to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father by me, but by me. And if you put your faith in him, uh, remember the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, and the whole world will get their socks in a knot because you believe in Jesus. So here he talks about his, his suffering a little bit. Verse 24, he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, that verse has caused a lot of people to scratch their heads. What is Paul saying there? Is he saying that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough for our salvation? And I can tell you emphatically, no way. That is not what he's saying. That would contradict everything that he has, has written uh, in the New Testament. Uh, it would contradict his, his message of grace through faith. It, it, that's not what he is saying. 
the word afflictions there uh, in, in the Greek is, is a word that's never used in the New Testament to speak of Christ's death, the sufferings that Christ suffered for our sins. It, it means distress or pressure or trouble, uh, which Paul had plenty of. Remember when we were in 2 Corinthians and we were in chapter 11, we saw Paul list all of the things that he had suffered for the sake of Christ, for the gospel's sake, for the sake of the church. And ordinarily, that word refer, refers to the trials in life, uh, not the pains of death. See, our sins were completely paid in full on the cross of Calvary. When Jesus died, remember the last thing he said, John nineteen thirty. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. See, he was declaring that it was done. It was complete. It was paid for. That, that word to telestai, uh, it means to complete, to finish, to accomplish, or paid in full. It was what the Romans stamped, stamped on your tax receipt when you paid that debt in full, to telestai. It, it's paid in full. That debt now has forever been canceled. It's paid for. It's done. And that's what Jesus said on the cross. It's finished. So there's no way that Paul could be saying that he had to suffer for our sins because Christ's death on the cross wasn't enough. That's not what he's saying. But see, there was and there still is suffering that needs to be done in order to bring the gospel to the lost. People are still suffering today because of it. Paul all the apostles, every missionary, every born-again believer is a part of the body of Christ. And, and as a part of the body of Christ, when we suffer persecution, when we suffer afflictions, as he says here, because of Christ, it really is as if Christ is suffering. It's as if Christ is taken on those afflictions. Remember, Jesus taught that whatever someone does or doesn't do to believers because they belong to Christ. It's like they're doing it or not doing it to him. In Matthew 25, look at what it says, what Jesus said in verses 31 through 40. He says, when the Son of Man, that's him, comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when, would, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then in verses 41 through 46, we won't read, but he addresses the wicked in the same way. When they didn't do those things for him. So you think about how that applies here with Paul's suffering. And how he is suffering for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the church. And people are making him suffer. They're afflicting him because of his relationship with Christ. Or even really, you know, think about Paul before he was saved. When he was on his way to Damascus to afflict Christians, he was going to arrest them, bring them back to Jerusalem, and hopefully kill them. In Acts 9, 4 and 5, it says, Then he, that's Paul, fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? 
And, and I, every time I read that, I could just envision Paul taking a big gulp right before he says, who are you, Lord? Just kind of knowing and thinking in his mind, don't say Jesus, don't say Jesus. And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. See, because he was persecuting Christians, he was afflicting Christians, he was persecuting Christ. Christ took that personally. And that's what Paul is saying here, that when he was suffering for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the kingdom of God, because his afflictions were aimed at Christ and Christ's gospel, it was as if Christ was being afflicted. And Paul was enduring those afflictions for the sake of the body of Christ, the church, taking the message that would both add to the church numerically by causing people to put their faith in Christ, but also his message, his teachings as he was there with them would strengthen those that were already a part of the church. And that's what Paul was called to do by the Lord. That was his ministry. That was the responsibility that God had given to him. Look at verses 25 and 26. He says, Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which was hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Now, you know, the, there's a few words there that a lot of times we kind of put a, a different slant on them in our day and age. And we kind of, you know, look at, like, say, like a minister is like, ooh, you know, if you turn off the lights on a minister, he probably has one of those halos glowing, you know, around him. You know, he's something, oh, you know, he's a minister kind of thing. The, the word is diakonos. We get our word deacon from that. But... That word diakonos, the word that's translated minister, means a person who renders service. It was used of, of waiters and waitresses at a restaurant kind of thing. That's a minister. They're serving you. That's what a minister of the gospel is supposed to be doing, serving. And the whole idea of stewardship here, it's the management, the oversight, the administration of somebody else's property, what belongs to somebody else. And in Paul's case, he was to manage, he had oversight, administration of the word of God, the, the word that belonged to God, God entrusted to Paul. And, and Paul was a steward of the word of God. And, and again, revealed to his saints, again, not the halo heads kind of thing, but you and I. Saint means a set-apart one, one who has been set apart from the world that's perishing. And that's everyone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. We're all saints. My first pastor used to say there's only two categories of people in the world, saints and ain'ts. And so if you read the first part of that in that light, Paul says, I became a servant according to the position of manager or administrator of what God gave me for you, you know, to fulfill the word of God. I like the way the New International Version words 24 through 26. Let's read that and have it up on the wall there. He says, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. That's the responsibility. Really, when you when we look at what he's said here, that's the responsibility of every pastor, elder, missionary, Bible study leader, is to present to you the word of God in its fullness, not to hold back. There are those that will hold back because they know, oh man, if I say this, if I say what the Bible says on this subject, people are going to hate me. There'll be people that leave the church. <clears throat> and you know, that's between God and them. You know, <laughs> those of us that teach the Bible were to teach the, God, the word of God in its fullness. 
the entire word of God. Not at the same, at the one teaching here, you know, <laughs> but as we teach and, and we meet here weekly and all, you know, not to, to skip over anything, but to teach the whole counsel of God, the whole word of God. But notice also, verse 26, and remember the, the heretics were talking about that hidden knowledge, the secret mysteries hidden from but a select few. <laughs> Paul's talking about the true mystery, the gospel found in the word of God in its fullness. The word mystery uh, is mysterion or, or mysterion, mysterion. Uh, it's, it's not the way we use the word today. Usually when we use the word mysterious or a mystery, it means that it's still something that's unknown. But this Greek word means something that was hidden, hidden before, but now it has been revealed. And the gospel of God sending his only begotten son to become a real man in order to die for the sins of mankind is all throughout the Old Testament. But for the most part, it was hidden, kind of hiding in plain sight, if you will. Remember when we were in 1 Corinthians, we saw in chapter 2, verse 14, that Paul said, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. We have to have the Spirit of God in us to really understand what God is saying in His Word. And, and you think about all of the Jewish leaders, uh, all the rabbis back in Jesus' day, how they rejected Jesus, even though many of them, especially the Pharisees, they knew the Scriptures. They, they, were, they were blinded because they weren't really receiving from the Holy Spirit. And even Paul, again, Paul a Pharisee. In fact, he calls himself you know, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Uh, he was persecuting the church, not understanding how Jesus is the Messiah, how he fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah's first coming. And it wasn't until after Jesus appeared to him, opening his eyes spiritually, that he, that he then realized, oh, all those things, all those scriptures that he knew, all of a sudden, boom, the light came on. And then all through the rest of the New Testament, you see Paul quoting Old Testament passages that prove Jesus is the Messiah. Much of the truths within the Old Testament, excuse me, are mysteries until a person is born again, until the Holy Spirit comes inside revealing the truth. And in fact, that's what Jesus said would happen when he went away and sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. In John 16, verses 12 through 14, Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. See, you take the word of God and declare it to us. The Holy Spirit takes the word of God, tells us, us what, it, what it means. He reveals it to us. He, he opens up that mystery, declares what was hidden before. And, and how many times have you read something in the Bible before you were born again? It was like, I don't get it. But then when you gave your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit came in and you go back, you read that same thing, you go, whoa, I never saw that before. <laughs> I, <laughs> I remember that. And it's still today, it's, it's awesome when I'll read something and I know I've read it 10, 20 times and just all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just causes that verse, kind of something within that verse to come out and go, wow, <laughs> wow, I didn't see that before. And that's the Holy Spirit. He, he, he kind of brings out the meaning. It just kind of makes a, a verse pop. It makes it really clear to us. It, it, it's God the Holy Spirit revealing to his saints the mysteries within the word of God. And, and verse 27, and, and this is another one of those mysteries. He says, to them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, 
which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, you talk about a mystery that God would save the Gentiles. That was a huge mystery to the Jews. <laughs> Even though all through the word of God, by the time of Christ, the Jews had developed a doctrine that said, <clears throat> didn't say that. <laughs> they said that the only reason God created Gentiles was to stoke the flames of hell. That's all you and I were as Gentiles. We're just to keep the fires of hell hot. <laughs> and, and they missed it, you know. That's one of the reasons. Remember, so much of the New Testament, so many of the writings of Paul, the letters were to refute the Judaizers. Remember, the Judaizers are saying, well, you know, before you Gentiles could really be saved, you got to stop being Gentiles. You got to be a good Jew first. You've got to keep the law. Guys, you got to get circumcised. You got to keep all the dietary laws, the Sabbath laws, and all that stuff. Then you could put your faith in Jesus and be assured of salvation. But again, it's by grace through faith. It's not by works. It's not by the law. But this was a mystery. They, they didn't get it. Salvation coming to the Gentiles. Folks, it was all through the Old Testament scriptures. They just either didn't see it or they refused to accept it, read around it. But that's what God meant. <laughs> it was for the salvation to come to the Jews. And some of these scriptures, they're just, I mean, they're so plain. Deuteronomy 32, 43. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people. Rejoice, O Gentiles. The Gentiles could rejoice. They could be included as part of God's people. Psalms 117, 1. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Loud him, all you peoples. And then you've got all these messianic prophecies in Isaiah, like Isaiah 11.10. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. Everybody knows that's Jesus, right? <clears throat> who will or who shall stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. Isaiah 42, 1, behold, my servant, again, Jesus, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And, and Isaiah 42, 6 and 7, I, the Lord, have called you, again, Jesus, in righteousness, and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. In Isaiah 49, 6, indeed he says, and, and this is, I, I love this, this passage. It, it's so awesome. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant, speaking to Christ, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. White Mountains of Arizona is included in the ends of the earth. <laughs> Isaiah 63, 60 verse 3, the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. And then there's that one Italian prophet, Malachi. Chapter 1, verse 11. I know, Malachi. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. And that word nations is the same word as the word Gentiles. What an awesome thing, huh? Now, I, I read all of those. So that, number one, you can see that as you see how, remember, remember actually how Paul ended up getting, getting arrested and put in chains and going to Rome? Do you remember what word he used when he was there in Jerusalem? 
and we were sharing his testimony of how he got saved and what God had said to him. It said as he was standing there on this, this kind of balcony there <laughs> that he was sharing, and they all heard him. All the Jews were down there. The Sanhedrin and, and devout Jews and all that stuff were listening to him. Everything was wonderful until he said, and then he said, I have sent you to preach to the Gentiles. And then the place just went nuts. No, no, tear him apart. He's not fit to live. He's going to the Gentiles. <laughs> but it's in their word. It's in their very scriptures, the Jewish scriptures of the Old Testament, that he would send the Messiah to save not just Israel, not just Jacob, but the Gentiles too. Okay? That it was there, and this really illustrates how someone can be blinded, how that... that some things are a mystery until God chooses to reveal them. And so he revealed them there by sending his Holy Spirit and, and giving us understanding and causing his word to come to light. But I share it also because I, I don't, is there anybody who is Jewish by birth here right now? Okay, Howard false. I should have known. I should have known. Yeah, but... But the rest of us, Gentiles, <laughs> I think it's awesome to be reminded that he spoke of us in the Old Testament, spoke of us that he was going to come and save us, along with his covenant people, Israel, <laughs> that we could have access. And what an awesome thing. <laughs> and there's a lot more scriptures, of both of of things that were a mystery and now are revealed, but, you know, we could go on. The thing is, we don't have all night, but it's very clear that this mystery that we Gentiles could be a part of the kingdom of God, having Christ in you, the hope of glory, was something they talked about, and they just didn't get it. And in verses 28 and 29, he says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. As we've seen before, and we talked about the start of this teaching tonight, perfection doesn't come by attaining some elevated level of knowledge, but by being in Christ, in Christ Jesus. That's how it comes. Paul's goal <laughs> was his, the end <laughs> that he was laboring towards, was that everyone would be able to stand before God perfect. And the only way that would happen was because they were in Christ Jesus. So he went about preaching. He went about teaching. That was his end. That was his goal. That was what he was laboring for. And he recognized that God was working in him mightily. You know, and as you read through the book of Acts, you see that, right? I mean, it's, you can't miss that, that God was working in Paul mightily. And, and folks, he's not bragging. No brag, just fact. <laughs> he's just stating the facts, that God's working in me mightily. Yeah, he was getting beat up for it. He, he'd been arrested, been shipwrecked, had been all kinds, you know, stoned and carried out the cities dead and all that stuff. But God was still working in him mightily. And and. God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. God used him to bring the gospel to Europe. And folks, you can't get around that. And you know what? Really, just in closing, God wants to work in each and every one of us mightily. You know that? God hasn't come to a point, you know, when the apostles died and said, well, that's it. You know, I'm just going to kick back and, hey, if the gospel spreads, it spreads. If not, no big deal. No, he still loves us. He still loves the lost. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And it's his desire for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's his desire. He wants to use each and every one of us mightily. And it's not by might nor by, you know, our might or our power but by his spirit that he will do that. His Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that was working in Paul, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of each and every born-again believer. And he wants to move us and to motivate us and to use us in mighty ways. All we got to do is let him. 
And it starts like we saw Sunday, by seeking him, by getting to know him more, getting to know his word, and then applying what we know to, to be able to serve him better, to serve him according to what we learn, to according to what, what we find out about him as we seek him. And as we start rolling, as we start serving him, you know, I was telling somebody not too long ago that it's a lot, a lot harder to steer a parked car. That if you, just, if you want to know where God wants you to serve him at, then start serving him. Start rolling for the Lord, and he'll steer you. He'll direct you. you just start serving him. Just start seeking him. And he'll eventually get you right to where he's called you to be. God is so good. Let's stand up and pray. Father, we do thank you for that. We thank you that you still want to do great things and you want to use us to do those things. Help us, Lord. Help us to be willing to be used by you. Lord, no matter how old we are, how young we are, or uh, whatever our station in life is, Lord, help us to be willing. Help us to be willing to let you use us and do whatever you want to do through us. Lord, help us to see ourselves, not as maybe the world would look on us, not as we have thought of ourselves in the past and and somehow limit you by, by our abilities or our talents or our education. But instead, Lord, we'd see us as people that you love, people that you want to use for your glory. Lord, help us to see us in that way and then present ourselves to you as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship him with one last song.